Hey there, Nick Genetakis here. In this video, we're going to go over the Docker Compose override file. This file is amazing because one of the things that it allows you to do is to run slightly different services in development and production while being able to reuse the same Docker Compose YAML file. And uh, let's just get right into it and look at a code example. So what we're looking at right now is the source code to my build a SaaS app of Flask course. And by the way, this is available on GitHub. So if you wanted to clone down this project and kind of mess around with it on your own or see a fully working example, you can do that. But for now in the video, if you just want to sit back and relax and learn a little bit more about this override file, then uh, feel free to do that. So let me just go ahead and open this up and we'll take a look at the regular Docker Compose YAML file. Now, you know, this video is not going to be like an introduction to Docker and Docker Compose. Uh, actually, on YouTube, I have uh, the first hour of my Docker course is available on YouTube for free. So if you want to learn the basics a little bit about what Docker is, you might want to check out that playlist. But uh, what we're looking at here, you know, is a regular Docker Compose YAML file. There's nothing special about this. I have a couple of different services, right? One for Postgres and Redis. Uh, the web service, which is the G-Unicorn server in the Flask context. And uh, there's also a worker one just to run Celery as a background worker, right? If you're using a different tech stack, you've probably seen a very similar Docker Compose file for your app as well. Now, if I go ahead and take a look here at this Docker Compose override file, you'll notice that this file is basically a Docker Compose file. Like there's nothing different about this file than what we just saw, other than it happens to be running a different service. In this case, this override file is running the Webpack service because this application uses Webpack to run uh, or handle its front end. You know, I did a whole video on that. If you want to check that out, uh, I'll leave a link to that in the description. But uh, yeah, this file itself, totally standard Docker Compose YAML file. And then we have this other file here too, right? This override example.yaml file. And this is actually a complete duplicate over this regular override file, right? I'm clicking between both of these files. They are both identical content. Now. Let's first go over why I have two identical files. So, well, maybe actually let's go over why this override file is even useful or exists. So let me just go ahead and just up this project in a different uh, terminal window here. You can see it's starting a whole bunch of different containers now. And uh, in a couple of seconds, the Webpack one's gonna pop up with like a thousand different lines. There we go. But if I scroll back up here to when I just started this, you can see here that it started all these different containers, right? Webpack, Postgres, Redis, the worker, and web. You know, all of these that I have highlighted now were in the main Docker Compose YAML file. And the top one for Webpack that's not selected, it was in the override file. So what's really cool about the override file in general, uh, this pattern with Docker Compose is basically when you do a Docker Compose up, right? With no arguments, right? Just like I did before uh, in the terminal, right? When Once this actually stops, when I do a Docker Compose up like this, what Docker Compose is going to do is it is going to first look to see if there is a Docker Compose YAML file in the current working directory. But it is also going to look to see if there is a Docker Compose override file as well. And if both of these files exist, then Docker Compose is basically going to combine them both into like a single file. Like from Docker Compose's point of view, they're both gonna become one. It's gonna, it's gonna run all the containers in both of these files. And if this override file doesn't exist, then Docker Compose will be like, okay, that's cool, man. I'm just gonna load up the Compose YAML file and uh, business as usual. So what's really cool about that idea is, and this is why the example file exists, chances are you want the Webpack container to run in like watch mode, right? Development mode version. Basically, you know, when you change one of your style sheets or JavaScript files, then Webpack is going to notice the change, make an incremental change in like 100 milliseconds or whatever, and then you can see the difference in your browser immediately. That's uh, perfect. That's exactly what you want in development. But when you're, when you're dealing with uh, Webpack in production, you typically just want to build your assets as part of your build process, right? Maybe inside of a, a Docker file or whatever, like however you build it is up to you, but uh, you wouldn't want that Webpack container running in production. Like there's no reason for it to watch your files and do incremental updates because, you know, there's there's no file changes. So the goal there is basically like, well, I just want to want, run the Webpack watcher in development, but not production. So all we have to do inside of this uh, override file is just add the Webpack service to the override file. And then, and here's like where the magic comes in with the example file. We just ignore the Docker Compose YAML 
uh, or Docker Compose override YAML file from version control. So if I go to my git ignore file here and go somewhere near the bottom, you'll notice that this override file is ignored from Git. So if I push this up to GitHub or whatever, then this file is not going to be pushed. However, there is an example file here, which uh, it will be meant for you as like the developer or whatever, to copy this example file over to the regular override.yaml file. You know, that's how you can get it working in development, but not production. And uh, you know, it's the same exact pattern as basically the env file. This env file, example file has all sorts of like sane defaults, but it has no sensitive information in it, like Stripe keys and email passwords and things like that. But my ENV file, which I'm not going to open on video, does have my Stripe keys and things like that. And uh, actually, if you go to the readme file of this repo, it says to get started, what you really need to do is, you know, copy this example file over to the regular file. Likewise, we're doing the same thing for the override file. And, uh, you know, Webpack is not really the only use case for using this override file. Uh, another really, really popular thing to do is, you know, let's say that you're running your application in production. You know, you could be on DigitalOcean, you could be on AWS, you could be on GCP. It doesn't really matter, right? Any main cloud provider. And a lot of these cloud providers, they have managed databases for you. So, you know, on AWS, you have the RDS service, which allows you to run a managed version of Postgres and MySQL. And DigitalOcean also has a managed PostSQL uh, database service that you can use. But, you know, let's say you're running in development, right? You might want to actually move your Postgres service into this override file if you plan to use like a managed Postgres server, because then in development, you can just do your Docker Compose up and get all of your services up and running, including Postgres. But then in production, you know, you would just make a configuration here to your environment file, like whoever, you know, however you have your application configured, and you would put in the details to connect uh, to the managed Postgres instance instead of the local one. So like the host here would, wouldn't be Postgres, right? Like assuming it was named like a Postgres service like it is here, you know, this would be uh, the URL to the RDS URL or DigitalOcean's managed one, like it doesn't matter. So that's really, uh, really, really why this Docker Compose override file is amazing because it allows you to basically run a local version of something and then choose to either maybe run it in production or not. And that really saves you a lot of headache and trouble because, you know, if you weren't using this override pattern, you know, you might decide to go down the rabbit hole of having something like a Docker Compose YAML file, but then like a Docker Compose dash prod YAML file or something like that, which would end up being a complete duplication of this file, except you would just remove one of the services. And like that becomes a nightmare to maintain because now it's like two files are basically identical. Whereas with this one, yeah, there's like almost no duplication. It's super straightforward to use once you understand how it works. And uh, I'm actually pretty excited that I figured this out like over a year ago. You know, it's it's deep down in document, uh, Docker Compose's documentation. But uh, yeah, it was one of those things. I am so happy that I figured it out because it made my uh, applications just a little bit easier to run in multiple environments. So that is going to wrap up this video. Uh, let me know in the comments below if you've been using this override file pattern or uh, if this video helped you out. Please give it a like and, and let me know how it goes in the comments if you decide to use it. And on that note, thanks a lot for watching this video and I will see you in the next one.